have arrived in the harbor of Cap Haitian on the north coast of Haiti, between Cuba and Puerto Rico, where the flagship of Christopher Columbus was wrecked in 1492. At that time, the land was inhabited by a friendly tribe of Indians, but they soon gave way to the Spaniards, who in turn surrendered to the French, so that at the present time, Haiti is the only Latin American republic in which French is the official language. Today is market day, and along the roads leading to town, there is a constant procession of colored folk, all traveling with one purpose, to buy, sell, or exchange something in the marketplace. During the Spanish and French rule, thousands of slaves were brought to this island from Africa. And later, thanks to the liberty, equality, and fraternity platform of the French Revolution, many of these slaves were set free. And out of their ranks came the leaders of revolutions that ultimately freed all the slaves in Haiti. And the greatest of these was his black majesty, King Henry Christophe, of whom we shall hear more later. The marketplace at Cap Haitian is a rendezvous for merchants and customers alike. Prices here are very reasonable. Avocados, for example, sell for a cent apiece. Green peas, a pound for a penny. And bananas are practically given away. The town of Cap Haitian was formerly the capital of the Republic. And during the reign of King Christophe, it reached the height of its glory. But today, it is only the ghost of what it used to be. Although a vast majority of Haiti's three million inhabitants are colored people, there are a number of mulattoes or mixed bloods and a smaller number of pure whites. Most of the mulattoes are French in language and education. And although they may have absorbed from their Negro ancestors much of their African mysticism and superstition, they have also inherited many admirable qualities of the early French settlers. The Haitian army now consists of about 200 officers and 3,000 men, all under the command of the President of the Republic. Many of these men are descended from the soldiers of King Christophe, of whom sensational stories have been told, such as the one about the regiment that marched off a 300-foot precipice because Christophe did not command them to stop. And this was done, it is said, for the benefit of a courier from the court of Napoleon who had questioned the loyalty and obedience of Christophe's soldiers. Among the notables of the French court who formerly resided in Haiti was Pauline Bonaparte, the sister of Napoleon. And this is the site upon which her sumptuous residence once stood. And now we behold the famous Palace of Saint Souci, built during the colorful reign of His Black Majesty, Henry Christophe, King of Haiti, and one of the most remarkable men ever produced by the colored race. Born a slave about 1765, he became a leader in the Haitian slave uprising was made president of Haiti in 1807 and was crowned king five years later. The valley in which this palace is situated was paved with marble tiles brought from France as ballast in the king's coffee ships. Costly works of art and French mirrors line the walls of the corridors and the throne room shone with a magnificence of gold and silver plate that fairly dazzled all beholders. King Christophe had many fine palaces in Haiti, but Saint Souci is the one where he held his court and where his queen and royal family resided. The dome church, which stands near the palace, was the royal chapel. Although Christophe himself was hardly a religious man, he wisely concluded that rule without religion would be too difficult. So he made the Roman Catholic faith the official state religion but with complete toleration of all other creeds. Not far from here, like a medieval fortress upon a mountain peak, stands the great citadel of King Christoph, one of the architectural wonders of the world, and a sinister reminder of the black Napoleon's power. The building of the pyramids of Egypt was nothing compared with the miraculous construction of this fortress upon a perpendicular mountain peak over 300 feet in height and more than a half a mile above sea level. Picture, if you can, an army of black workmen under the yoke of a black despot, lugging and hauling a half million tons of building material up the mountain from the sea, with nothing but the brawn of their sweating bodies to aid them. 
The finished job on level ground would have been a great architectural achievement. But upon a peak mountain rising from a tropical jungle, verily it matches, if it does not excel, the building of the Egyptian pyramids. Henry Christoph's mighty citadel now serves as an attraction for tourists who have only recently discovered it. Here there were garrison quarters for 10,000 soldiers and a royal suite for Henry and his queen. It is said there is a secret underground tunnel that leads from the citadel to Sans Souci and that there is buried somewhere beneath its fortress a million and a half pounds of sterling. Only the king and his mulatto engineer knew the hiding places of the citadel. And as soon as it was completed, it is alleged that Kristoff deliberately pushed the engineer over the edge of this parapet. Three hundred and sixty-five cannon, one for each day in the year, were hauled up to the citadel to be fired upon an enemy that never came. Christoph himself directed the only shot that was ever fired from here, and that destroyed an unfortunate Negro who was sleeping under a tree in the valley below when he was supposed to be working, confirming the fact, as it were, that Christoph was allergic to laziness in his people. In 1820, after 14 years of despotic rule, Henry Christoph was stricken with paralysis. His subjects, demanding his abdication, revolted against him, and realizing that his reign was over, he shot himself with a golden bullet. Deserted by his own people, his widow and two daughters, with the help of one loyal friend, dragged his huge body from the palace up the mountainside to this spot and threw it into a pile of wet lime so that his enemies could not desecrate it. And so, here lie the mortal remains of his black majesty, Henry Christoph, the mightiest monarch of the Negro race. Although he was powerful and clever, he was as despotic as the pharaohs who built pyramids. And now that all the fanfare that attended his life has subsided, Haiti has taken root again, and her people are going forward, progressing admirably under the guidance of democratic government. Nevertheless, the sun never sets in the harbor of Cap Haitian, that a voodoo voice in the wilderness of Haiti does not cry out, Viva Henry Christophe! And it is said that it comes from the ghost of Henry Christoph himself. <laughs>